Hi, folks. So Emmy and I are here today to talk with you about um, what's going on in Israel-Palestine. So we know that this is a complex issue. It's not easy. And we also know that as people of faith, as people of the Christian faith, as people, you know, who have been influenced by this Abrahamic um, family, we are concerned about this. This impacts us and we want to think about how we respond. How do we think about this even? So to start us off, um, we're going to be reading um, an Episcopal response. So this is from Bishop Michael Curry, and this is his statement on violence in the land of the Holy One. So Emmy and I will be trading off reading different paragraphs. So I'll start us off. One more time, we awake to the news of violence. Reports come in, even as you read this, about violence that has caused death life-changing injury, and the destruction of property and lives. Violence which is born of frustration rooted in injustice and the violation of international law, and in truth, the violation of human rights and human decency. In the name of the God of all creation, the violence must stop regardless of where it comes from and to whom it is directed. One more time, the Episcopal Church stands to say that violence is not the way forward. We say the expansion of Israeli settlements at the expense of Palestinian families must end. We say incitement, which encourages violence, must end. We say enough is enough. One more time, the Episcopal Church encourages the government of the United States and others who have influence, who are of goodwill, and who genuinely seek peace to be partners in peacemaking, to bring about a negotiated settlement to the long-standing conflict, which has consumed both Israelis and Palestinians. One more time, we find ourselves full of sorrow and sadness. We find ourselves grieving over the loss of life, destruction of homes, and the fear that lives in the hearts of tens of thousands of innocent people. We join all people of faith to offer up prayers for healing, wholeness, restoration, and reconciliation. And we pray God to grant wisdom and courage to all those in authority to seek peace and pursue it without delay, without excuses, without confusion, and with only one agenda, a negotiated and equitable agreement for peace between Israelis and Palestinians once and for all. Signed, the Most Reverend Michael B. Curry, the presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church. So Emmy, I know this is something that you care about. This is something I care about. And I wonder if you could just share a little bit about why you care about this. Absolutely. So I feel as a person of faith, I am called, we are called always to look for what Jesus would call the least among us. Mm -hmm. Who is the least among us? Who are people who are in shackles and need to be freed? And I think one of the prime examples here, unfortunately, are these settlements in Palestinian land where Israelis have sort of encroached on territory that has been agreed upon. Um, and it's very difficult to understand why this is happening, but I understand it in terms of a traumatized people traumatizing another traumatized people and then vice versa, right? There's violence coming from both sides and yet there is this basic injustice that has brought on this pain of where is my home mm. and who gets to decide how much worth I have in society who gets to decide what it's like to move from town to town I remember um, I was going through uh, one of the checkpoints from um, one city in Palestine back to Bethlehem which is sort of a mixed city and somehow I had misplaced my passport and I had gotten separated from my group and it was absolutely terrifying. You know, here I am a young white woman who clearly probably isn't Palestinian. Um, and yet it was just absolutely terrifying. There were guns that were, you know, as long as my leg that were in people's belts. 
And I just was wondering, what is it like for someone with darker skin, someone who's Palestinian, someone who has family on the other side, right? Because there are Palestinians in Israeli land and there are Israelis in Palestinian land. Mm -hmm. And yet um, it's just very hard. I was terrified and I know that I'm a person of privilege. And that really struck me as there is something going on here where people sometimes spend hours at these checkpoints. There are long lines and they're getting interrogated as they're going from place to place. And so there's a basic unfreedom that's happening. And I believe that the gospel is one of freedom. And I believe that our Israeli and Palestinian friends and neighbors, they are part of our religion typically. They are part of our religious family, I meant to say. They are part of the Abrahamic tradition. We all come from the same pilgrim family and we diverged and yet we have so much in common. We have more in common than we have apart. And yet we have this horrifically difficult history of the Holocaust leading to, you know, Jews needing a home and nobody wanted to take them in. And so the land of Israel became a home and yet there were people already living there. And it has been incredibly complicated ever since. And the anti-Semitism and the anti-Islamic sen sentiments are just so painful. And it's important to remember that people are not monolithic. Not all Israelis are in support of occupation or of checkpoints or of anything that makes uh, Palestinians feel like a lower class or, um, even part of a caste. And sometimes people even use the word apartheid or ethnic cleansing. Um, I'm uncomfortable with those terms based on uh, my understanding of the Holocaust. And so, but I will say, I saw a lot of second class citizen actions going on. Um, and so I believe that the Christian gospel is one of freedom of looking for the least of these, of caring for the poor and people are put in situations where they are wondering where their home is, wondering how they will survive, wondering if they will be separated from their families and able to visit. Um, and also there has been a very large um, discrepancy between who's getting the vaccine right now, which is troubling. And it's not to say that the Palestinian government is perfect, right? There's a lot of corruption and there is terrorist influences um, that make it so that innocent citizens are struggling. Um, and yet the vaccine rates are just so different among Israelis and Palestinians. So a long answer to a short question, I feel like Christians have an obligation to stand with people who are being treated as lesser and to stand with people who are experiencing fear. And this isn't to be anti-Semitic. Um, I have heard over and over, and as a person with Jewish roots, I feel like I have the authority to say, it's okay to criticize Israeli government without it being anti-Semitic um, because the Israeli government has a lot to be criticized for. And our government, the United States government has a lot to be criticized for in terms of its partnership with funding incredibly powerful tools of war mm -hmm. that the Palestinians simply do not have. Um, but I feel like there is an opportunity to speak up, to make a change, to ask our government officials to say, we don't need to fund this war. We need to help end it. We can use that money for our good here. And we can make sure that we're not costing people their lives. Mm -hmm. If our gospel is one of freedom, if America calls itself a Christian nation, why are we bringing more violence into the world, more potential for violence? So I deeply care about this. And we'll talk a little bit later about both of our experiences traveling in the Holy Land. Um, Lance and I had really different tour guides and mentors and teachers with us. Um, and so, Lance, what makes you care about this? Yeah, so, well, thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like there was so much that you said that really struck a chord in me. 
Mm -hmm. I think on one hand, this to me feels very much like a mirror for us to examine ourselves. Mm. Like I think, you know, we talk about like America as a Christian nation and America as sort of like the peacemakers of the world or maybe we have this idealized vision of our own nation. And mm -hmm. then when people criticize our nation, especially like from within, right? Mm -hmm. We often get labeled as being bad or wrong or ungrateful. And yet and the reality is like there, like if I really love something, I want it to be the best that it can be. Mm -hmm. So like, even I think about like my partner, right? Like my partner and I will talk about, you know, like, hey, this is something that I need that I feel like I'm not getting, right? We can tell each other that. And it's not because we're ungrateful for each other. It's mm -hmm. because we are grateful for each other. We want our relationship to be all that it can be. Right. So we're willing to have a conversation and to navigate um, differences. We're willing to say, I recognize that there's going to be conflict no matter what in our relationship. Right. There are some conflicts that are that are easy to solve, but they require us coming to the table to sit down and talk to each other. But mm -hmm. then there are perpetual conflicts that are not going to be easy to solve and there's not going to be any clear way forward. Mm -hmm. And that's because there are usually, so this is from uh, the Gottmans. They are um, two psychologists who really do a lot of research on like marriage and what makes marriages work. But they, um, they talk about this notion of the perpetual conflict that is usually rooted in dreams that are either unrealized or even um, unconscious to us, right? That we're carrying and they're not being realized or acknowledged in some way in the relationship, mm -hmm. right? So we can even see here in Israel, Palestine, right? There are different dreams for this land. There are different dreams for how this land will get used, for who gets access to things on the land, right? And so that creates this perpetual conflict because people don't know how to talk about these dreams and how these dreams can coexist. Right? And then thinking about our own nation, right? Our own America, the USA, right? Thinking about the ways that we have these perpetual conflicts too, that our government has failed to acknowledge over and over again, right? The reality is that, you know, we are um, a group of um, people who were in many times searching for a safe home, right? The European colonists early on, not all, but there were certainly some who were fleeing religious persecution, right? They were looking for a place that they could land, a soft place that they could land. Mm. And yet what ended up happening by and large was that these colonists ultimately became occupiers of land that was not their own, right? They stole resources, right? They purchased land when there was not even a sense of like owning land to begin with, right? Like there's this whole way in which colonialism destroyed so much of what was here, right? We created our own cultural genocide as European colonists. And so I think to be able to acknowledge that I think has a lot to do with how much we can acknowledge what's happening in Israel, Palestine right now. I think mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with how we can understand who's there. You know, um, there's a great book called My Grandmother's Hands and it's about, um, it's about trauma, but it's particularly about racial trauma in America. So he's very much writing from a black American perspective. And he talks about um, the ways that trauma is one of the like least thought of like concepts when it comes to racial relations. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about like, well, if you just have anti-racism training, everything will be okay. Or if you just become a nice white person, things will be fine. Or mm -hmm. if, you know, people just get more training on how to treat people, everything will be better. But the reality is that um, Menachem brings up in the book is that all of us have, you know, these legacies that we are living with, right? So we know epigenetically now that our bodies carry the trauma of our ancestors, right? We know this scientifically. We have studies that can show us this, particularly because of um, descendants of the Holocaust survivors, right? That's really where a lot of these studies came from. But he talks about the ways that trauma lives in our bodies, 
Mm -hmm. right? So even if we have not experienced firsthand acute or complex ongoing trauma, we oftentimes have in our ancestry, right? You think about the colonists who came to the United States before it was ever called the United States who came to this land, right? They were often coming fleeing traumatic events, yeah. right? They had trauma in their bodies. Yeah. Like where did people start doing lynchings, right? Lynchings was not made in America. White people, Europeans were witnessing other white people being lynched, right? They were witnessing what it was like to have a class system where they did not have power. And so I think that again, there's this whole dynamic that is often unsaid, that is often unrealized. Mm. right they were they had a dream to be free they had a dream to not worry about being lynched themselves right they had those dreams but with that unresolved trauma living in our bodies it's so easy yeah. right to then inflict that trauma right it stays in our body and if we don't know how to deal with it if we don't develop the tools we don't have the capacity to really name what's happening and we don't know how to really interact with and be with one another. Yeah. And, and so what I just, the trauma keeps happening, right? right? In already traumatized bodies. Yes. It just becomes intergenerational and then eventually cultural trauma. Yep. Right? And this is where the phrase uh, Bruce Perry talks about uh, states becoming traits, traumatic states mm. become personality traits. And over time, as we pass these traits on, they become cultural traits. And what may we just assume to be normal cultural expression really has its origin in a traumatic response to something mm. that we never found a way to resolve, right? It's our own adaptation to things, right? So in some ways it's our resilience keeping us alive, yet the way that we adapt to things is usually helpful in the moment, but it, when it becomes a trait, it's not usually helpful long term. No. And so I say, I think that we see this reflected right now in Israeli, in the Israeli Palestinian um, conflict that we're witnessing, which Absolutely. even to call it conflict, right, can be difficult because that assumes two equals often, yes. right? So even the way we frame it, I think, says a lot about how we perceive what's happening. Absolutely. And what we name it perceives changed our perception, right? I think mm -hmm. when I was first taught about it, I was taught about it as the Arab-Israeli conflict. Mm -hmm. And what if you name it the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? And what if conflict is not the right word? A lot of um, infographics have gone up on Instagram sort of sharing a short history. And a lot of the ones that have been focused on the trauma being inflicted on Palestine have talked about how this is not a fair fight. The United right. States is funding right. very fancy weapons of war and the Palestinians have rocks and grenades and it doesn't excuse throwing rocks and grenades. And yet when you cage people, you wonder what happens. Mm -hmm. right? You wonder what's gonna happen to them. And it's very, very sad. I feel one of the things that I really just felt deep within my bones as I was exploring Israel and Palestine um, for a seminary class where we had spent, you know, the whole semester talking about the history of the Abrahamic religions. And of course, you can't talk about the history of the Abrahamic religions without mentioning all the things that they've done to each other and are still mm -hmm. doing to each other. Um, and we went to Israel for in Palestine for three weeks. Um, and had Palestinian tour guides, Israeli tour guides, Jewish tour guides, atheist tour guides, Muslim tour guides, Orthodox Christian tour guides. They really tried to get us a balanced perspective. And what I heard from each and every one of them was, we are traumatized people traumatizing other people, or we are a traumatized people being traumatized even more. Trauma lives in these bodies. It is impossible to be Jewish and not have trauma live within your body. When I went to, you know, 
Auschwitz in Poland two summers ago and saw my family's name in the book of life. Mm -hmm. You know, the book of the 6 million people who were killed in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. You can't have that not affect you. You can't have this family history not affect you. And my family was so traumatized by it that I didn't even really understand Judaism until I was in seminary mm -hmm. learning Christian theology. I never had a bat mitzvah. I never went to temple. I never learned a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and so just that trauma, right? Not even wanting to introduce it to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's impossible to be Jewish and not have this trauma. It's impossible not to hear the terrorist groups that say, you know, Jews must die, death to Israel. It's impossible to hear these and not want weapons of war. And it's also impossible for Palestinians whose land keeps being occupied and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and more and more borders are being closed and there's poverty beyond poverty there. You can't help but be traumatized by that. Mm -hmm. It was just, I just felt this like wave of trauma everywhere we went. And perhaps especially when we went to visit the holiest sites, thinking about all the people who have died to make these holy sites real, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were attacks on, on Ramadan at Al-Aqsa Mosque um, just a week or two ago. You know, this very holy place was infiltrated by um, the Israeli army. And it's just so disturbing that these places that are supposed to represent peace represent you know conquering they represent bloodshed they represent fighting they represent people trying to say this land is ours mm -hmm. over and over and over again and the church of the holy sepulcher which is you know the holiest christian site like there are like 14 different orthodox denominations that claim space in there and they can't get along in there and it's just like oh my goodness right like it just you know it's it's really hard i just felt it everywhere a lot of people cried a lot and we had it was a group of white students except for one middle-aged black man and when he saw the different water sources that the Palestinians were getting mm. versus the Israelis were getting. He just wept because he thought about South Africa. He thought about the different water fountains in the 60s. He thought about different things. And he was just overwhelmed by that cultural trauma of racism. He was just completely overwhelmed in a way that none of us white students could fully understand. We tried to be there for him, but we knew that we couldn't fully understand what it was like to see, you know, these large like black gallons of water above Palestinian homes and white gallons of water above Israeli homes and knowing the quality of water was probably pretty different in these occupations. Um, and so just really striking to see him suffer in a way that none of us could understand. Um, there's just so much trauma here. And, you know, that's part of why we want to talk about it is what can we do? I feel like oftentimes we hear about these things and are just left with this enormous sort of like gift box that feels like Pandora's box of like, I know more now, but what can I do about it? And so we really want to leave you some resources in um, the description box of this, of how to get in touch with your Congress people, your senators, your um, it's just helping us shape our future in this conflict and our own understanding of war and what it can do to people. Yeah. I mean, what comes up for me in all of that is the depth of the human need to feel protected, to feel safe, right? And so I think one of the results of trauma is often like you lose your sense of safety in the world. Okay. Right? your your world is shattered it's like what what is a safe world i don't know right like it it robs you of that sense in which the world can be safe yep 
And, you know, I think, you know, thinking especially about living in America and living, you know, I mean, right now I'm living in suburbia and I feel pretty safe here in a lot of ways, in some ways, not so much, but I mean, that's my own sort of, you know, experiences that I bring with me, but Mm -hmm. recognizing that, you know, when you feel that that safety is jeopardized in some way, you will do a lot to make it feel safe again. You will do things that are automatic, right? Trauma does not just wait for your rational brain to think mm-hmm. about this, right? Like there are, the, but the base of our brain is where all of these things are happening, right? Because we want to know that it's going to be okay. I will feel safe. Mm-hmm. So of course, if you're descended from a lineage of a whole mass of people trying to exterminate people who identify with your religious and ethnic identity, you're going to want to feel safe, right? And of course, if you live in a land where you feel like you've had to negotiate for your own space, you're going to want to feel safe. If you live in a land where you're not sure if you're even going to have the resources to survive, you're going to want to feel safe. So we can understand the responses that on the outside may seem extreme, right? We can understand how you might say, well, I don't know why they're doing that. Well, if we just pause and think about times when we felt unsafe, how we respond, you know, I think again, like anytime that we find ourselves judging others harshly, that's Mm -hmm. a moment for us to say, what's coming up in me? Yeah. What does this bring up for me? Like, I think if we're going to think about peace, like peace begins with us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's a both hand, right? It's not an either or. It's like, it's not a do like sign the petitions or find peace in yourself, right? It's always, I think we're trying to find a holistic sense of being here. How do we connect with what's happening inside of us? Yeah. Right? How do we actually bring change to us? Because these things are happening here in our own country too, in some way. It's not the exact same thing, but like you said, even in what you just shared, right? There are parallels. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these automatic responses never excuse violence, right? They can help us understand a little bit more and not just demonize one side and 100% support the other, right? Both of them have done terrible things. And yet right now, we're, what we're seeing is clearly not a fair fight. Mm-hmm. And so right. part of the safety, part of providing the safety, and part of what a lot of these petitions are about, and these actions and protests are to end the occupation, so that Palestinians have the land that they have been promised, mm-hmm. that they have a safe place to do their homes. Right. They have a safe place to know that they have a farm that will have income that will not be bulldozed the next day. I met many farmers whose farms were just taken and that was it, it was over. And so clearly the most important thing about this Holy Land is who gets the land? And that's where all of this comes from is that this heartbreaking reality that this place that is so holy is also the most bloody land in the whole world. And so the biggest opportunity for us to provide that sense of safety is to say no to occupation. And some people, including me, have looked up what companies work in occupied lands and um, divest from them. It's called um, the BDS movement. I forget the exact um, letters for it, but you know, I looked up who's there and I make sure whenever I can to buy from another company that isn't on stolen land. Yeah. So that's why most of the petitions and the protests relate. When people say free Palestine, they're usually talking about ending the occupation. Mm -hmm. And can you say a little bit more about what ending the occupation looks like? Like Mm. What does that mean on the ground? What changes from the way things are now? Mm. I think it looks like freedom of movement 
and freedom to know that your house will still be there the next day. Mm. If your house was taken, getting reparations, um, knowing that you'll have livelihood, feeling like you're not a second class citizen, feeling like you're free to move about Israeli lands as well. Um, feeling like you're free to go to Al-Aqsa Mosque and know that you won't be harmed. Mm. Um, and freedom to know that the land that you have been promised is still the land that you have. Palestinian land has shrunken and shrunken and shrunken over time through wars and losses and occupation. And so just making sure that there is a place, you know, people who believe in a two state solution advocate for this, the end of the occupation and the establishment of, you know, each having their own place. And, you know, one of the things that I had really never heard of before I went to Israel and Palestine was the one state solution, which is really just the land remains the land and the occupation ends. And that there really is no establishment of new nations. It's just that life continues, but with a lot more freedom. And I was struck by that. And a lot of people on the ground said the two state solution is dead. So we need to work to make the one state solution. And so I can't fully say what it looks like, but I know that that basic sense of safety that we're talking about, you know, the very bottom of the hierarchy of needs that makes it so that we can feel <laughs> yeah. anything else, just that that is there, that home is there, that yeah. freedom for children to play in the street and not get hit by a missile is there and that refugee camps close and that people have homes the refugee camp that i went to was so painful to see mm -hmm. and while we were there um there was a children's dance class going on and we got to watch them dance and see their resilience and yet it was just like why do they have to be so resilient at such a young age one of my classmates cried as she was watching them dance because she said, this is just so discordant with what their feelings probably are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what ending occupation looks like is that sense of freedom, unfreedom becomes freedom. Yeah. We all need to feel like we are free to exist, to roam, to see the people we love and to have basic safety in the streets and not to be attacked and not to attack, right? Nobody is innocent here. And yet, as we've said, the, the weapons that are being fought with are not even. Mm -hmm. And I wanna indicate uh, one thing that I think often gets um, mixed up a little bit. Zionism is not a dirty word. Zionism literally mm -hmm. just means believing that the Jews should have a homeland. And so one can be a Zionist one can be Jewish and still fight for the end of the occupation. You know, there are organizations like Jewish Voices for Peace that mainly involve younger Jews who have, you know, been on birthright trips and been giving only the Israeli point of view who say, I think something's going on here that I don't fully know about and that I wasn't taught about and I want to understand more about. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really moved by folks who are willing to stand in the middle and say, hey, I'm a Jew, I'm a Zionist, and I also believe in the free Palestine movement. Right. You can be a little bit of everything. And we have to be with people who are being oppressed. Jesus calls us to that. And Jesus calls us to ask, who is my neighbor? Both of these people groups are our neighbor, but one neighbor is really, really struggling right now in a way that is hard for us to understand. Yeah, right. I think, you know, what I hear and what you just shared is this like, we're building a tent that can hold multiple things, right? To be able to say a both and approach rather than an either or. I mean, it's not about saying, well, if I'm pro freeing Palestine, then that means I'm anti-Semitic, right? Like that's mm -hmm. not the case at all. Yeah. But if we are going to, right, I think we have to 
notice, right? How do we characterize the people we're talking about, right? I think to be anti, like to be Islamophobic or anti-Semitic and even to recognize Palestinians are also, there's a lot of Christian Palestinians. Yes. You know, yes. so like when I went to Israel, I went there um, with a very like Christian Zionist sort of uh, framework. I, you know, I was in my high holy days as I like to call them living in my, um, my intense Pentecostalism. Um, and I went with college. I was there for five weeks. We lived in downtown Jerusalem area, which was really great. Um, like Ben Yehuda street, like all the fun things. Uh, but of course we were super conservative, so we weren't going to partake in any fun things that were too fun, you know, but, um, but we did drink lots of aroma coffee. So good. Um, which, by the way, there's aroma coffee in New York City. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, downtown, downtown okay. Manhattan. So, but anyways, side note. Um, one of the things that I remember is, you know, we were getting like a, a super pro Christian Zionist sort of like view, like which basically kind of felt like, well, the Jews have to be here and they have to have a Jewish state in order for Jesus to come back. Like, and no worries, but <laughs> Jews won't be saved. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I mean, it was like, and there was this like argument constantly about like, well, will the Jewish people believe in Jesus when he comes back or will they not, right? And if they don't believe, well, of course, they're not going to be saved, right? There was like this whole thing, right? And, but it just felt really like the problematic Jewish... theology. Oh, we for sure. That. The yeah, call yeah. of God on people is irrevocable. Right. God does not just abandon God's own people. So just want to say that Christian yeah. Zionism that literally just focuses on getting the second temple back on, you know, the holiest part in order for Jesus to come, but only to save Christians and to say bye to the Jews who have helped them. Mm -hmm. Really right. gross. I mean, it was very anti-Semitic, right? It's very mm -hmm. supersessionism is one of the theological terms, right? It's like, we're just here to replace, you know, the Jewish people, yeah. but we also need them. So be nice to them and support them. And I feel like that's sort of why, like, there was such an emphasis on, like, the government, the U.S. government supporting Israel because it was about Christian, well, it was about a certain view of Christian salvation. Mm. right and so it it just felt like this it wasn't like authentically concerned for the jewish people as being jewish people no. right but then it also had an islamophobia inherent in that view then because it was like well obviously then anyone who's not jewish here is bad yeah unless they're christian then they're okay yeah Right. So it then created this sort of anti-Palestinian idea. But then we went, so every Friday we would do a service project somewhere. Mm -hmm. And one Friday we did go into, um, do, we worked with a Christian organization in Palestine. And there were lots of American Christians there who were working. And I remember these people were not, um, like, they were not Christian Zionists, you know, they were like very nuanced in their views. And mm -hmm. we were like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like we were riding the bus together with them and they were telling us how, you know, they're like, oh, you guys don't support Palestine, like freeing Palestine. We were like, why would we support freeing Palestine? You know, it was like this, yeah. like it was unheard of to us that there was this like other way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what often happens within our Christian narrative in America is it's like we begin to equate being Christian with being like pro-Israeli occupation. Yes. Even it, it, we don't even have the full language though. And we don't even know that that's fully what we're supporting. At least I didn't. But yeah. that's sort of what I was sold as a bag of goods that I had to buy into if I was going to believe Jesus was somehow going to magically come back on the Mount of Olives and the yeah. world was going to end and blah, 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 all the things that I no longer hold on to. But I did really hold on to it then, you know? So I just think looking back at my time there, I can see how our theology matters. 
Mm -hmm. right? How we frame all of this matters, how we understand what God is doing in the world, how we anticipate God working, right? How do we see God in other people? Right? Yes. I think. How do we see Jesus in religions where Jesus is not the savior? Right. And as ministers, how do we preach from the pulpit? Mm -hmm. right. Because <laughs> for ministers, preaching in the Presbyterian church is considered the word of God. Mm. It is considered so highly. Mm -hmm. That's why they're called ministers of word and sacrament. Right, right. The word is supposed to be inspired by God's spirit. And if we are preaching an anti-Palestine or anti-Israel bent from the pulpit, we are damaging the hearts of the people who are listening to us. Mm. And if we are not being nuanced from the pulpit, we are also damaging the hearts of people. Who says that I can't be pro-Israel and pro-Palestine? As a mm -hmm. Christian who has Jewish roots and dead relatives from the Holocaust, and yet also despises the occupation, can I not be both? Can we not have both and? Can we not stand up in the pulpit and denounce injustice anywhere? Mm -hmm. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. Right. And unfreedom anywhere is a threat to freedom anywhere. Right. And so our theology matters. Our mm -hmm. theology is what inspires us when we're writing. It's what inspires us when we're considering how to be involved citizens in our own, in our own country. It inspires us in, you know, for our Congress people, it inspires them in how they vote, how they write, how they um, engage and shape our country and the way we relate to other countries. Mm -hmm. It really matters. It okay. really matters. And our, if our theology is not making us more loving, perhaps we need to abandon that theology. Yep. Augustine said something to the effect of, if the scriptures have not made you more loving to your neighbor, you have not begun to read or understand the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what do we do? What do we do? And or from my pen, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> what were you gonna say? I was just gonna say, you know, from my Pentecostal tradition, William Seymour, who is like one of the famous early preachers in Pentecostalism in Azusa Street said, you know, if, if the evidence of spirit baptism is not love, then I don't know what is. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Our faith should bring freedom, not unfreedom, where we go, where we preach, where we write, where we protest, where we talk, where we try to get involved in some way that's bigger than us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, as we wrap up this conversation and as we consider what the heck do we do with all this information, you know, I really encourage you guys to check out Jewish Voices for Peace and Christians for Middle East Peace and other organizations and denominations that have been putting out statements. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew any Palestinian organizations offhand, but I'll try to put them in the description box. Um, but really just paying attention, paying attention to the voices that are seeking nuance. And if you feel that the occupation should be ended, um, which I hope that you will be curious about after hearing us talk about the importance of home, um, there is a bill called HB 2590 that is going through the house right now. And so I encourage you to look up who your representative is and who your senators are and write to them about why you think we should be thoughtful about this, um, why you think we should protect Palestinians. And thankfully, there are some great groups like the Episcopal Church who have, you know, a script that you can use to write or call. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently, you most effectively reach your representatives with paper letters rather than emails or phone calls. And so don't forget how to use stamps and write envelopes. 
especially for you younger listeners out there. I know that not all my friends know how to address an envelope, but it's important. So those are sort of my hopeful words for you guys, that our words do make a difference. Our theology makes a difference. Each individual conversation makes a difference. And, you know, I'm grateful that we have this podcast where we share diverse viewpoints. And I pray that you have heard something in here that really makes you think and really makes you wonder, as Lance said, like where God is and how God is moving in this land and in these different peoples. Yeah. And the final piece that I'll add is, I think in addition to that, to check in with our bodies, to notice, you know, freedom is not something that just like, oh, we decided freedom was important. Like freedom is something our bodies long for on their own. You know, safety is something that our brains are seeking and our bodies will fight to have. Mm. So learn to honor that in yourself so that you can learn to honor it in other people. Mm. Right? It's all connected. Yeah. And the more that we can care about it in ourselves, I think the more we can make room for that in the world. Mm. That it takes time to get there. But keep checking in. Absolutely. Think about yourself as a person and think about yourself as one of a global citizen. Mm. And, you know, the crowd of 8 billion people who are all loved by God, who all bear God's image, who all long for safety, who long to hear God's voice, or, you know, however they describe it, they long to hear some reason for what's going on, some, something that encourages us and says, we're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Emmy. This was a pleasure. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on and thank you all for listening. Um, I pray that you're having a wonderful day as you listen to this. Yes. All right.